Nuclear Hot Seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear Hot Seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear Hot Seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but the activists are linking. Nuclear Hot Seat. It's the bomb. <laughs> Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we again present Voices from Japan two separate pieces that are directly related. We have former Futaba Mayor Katsutaka Itogawa on the deep problem still faced by evacuees from his town and his appeal to the world. And we also hear from filmmaker Satomi Horikiri about her film Driven Out of a Nuclear Town on the people who evacuated from Futaba to her hometown of Saitama. We will also fit both of these in with the entire Oishinbo manga controversy and a discussion of the reality of nosebleeds in Japan after Fukushima. Plus, there will be a dual numbnuts of the week. Two famous people, too. One would think they would be our allies. And that will be coming up in just a few minutes. Today is Tuesday, May 20th, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. So many stories this week, it was hard to figure out where to start, but there's one of lasting importance that I think we need to be made aware of first. Tokyo Shinbun has confirmed that the Fukushima Prefectural Government and Fukushima Medical University signed a secrecy agreement with the pro-nuclear International Atomic Energy Agency. Fukushima Medical University has been the main source of all public data on exposure and has been dictating what medical care many in the region were allowed to receive related to radiation issues. Patients were warned by nurses to not bring up radiation concerns to the doctor that they were planning to see or they would not be allowed to see the doctor. Great way to get objective data, don't you think? Both the prefecture and the medical university have been the subject of growing distrust from the public due to their efforts to downplay problems and withhold information from the public. The actual document exists at this time only in a very choppy mechanical translation, but it is referred to as a memorandum of mutual cooperation. In the agreement, it spoke about all measured data and accident information, such as thyroid cancer in children, to be designated as secret rather than risk stirring up the anxiety of residents. This makes perfect sense in light of the IAEA's report that said that there was, quote, no modulation of health by exposure, end quote, in the Chernobyl nuclear accident. Muto Ruiko head of the Fukushima nuclear power plant prosecution team is concerned that there is a precedent that the IAEA has hidden information about the health effects of Chernobyl and is doing the same with Fukushima. We will of course keep following this. At Fukushima in the seawater, record high radiation levels have been observed at five monitoring points. This is what TEPCO said last Friday, May 16th. The findings followed a recent series of record high levels of radiation detected in groundwater at the plant. TEPCO said that the cause of the rises in seawater radiation level is unknown. Can't you guys figure out that it's all coming from Fukushima? 1900 becquerels per liter of tritium was detected in seawater sampled on Monday, up from the previous record high of 1400 becquerels which raises the question, why are they suddenly measuring tritium instead of cesium? Is the result less terrifying? TEPCO also reported that 
at a point between the water intakes for units one and two, sea water sampled on Thursday was found to contain 840 becquerels of strontium-90, which causes bone cancer, and other beta-ray-emitting isotopes, up from a previous record of 540 becquerels. They're starting to make it sound like a stock market report of pending death. The Mainichi Daily News reported, We are facing a problem so large, it's impossible to see all its dimensions. There is the relentless flow of the groundwater, a massive amount of it gushing into the plant's basements every day. If this water pours into the reactor buildings and touches the atomic fuel inside, it picks up high concentrations of radioactive material. At the moment, this radioactive water is impossible to deal with. We are now three years into the Fukushima nuclear crisis, and we still cannot see everything that is going on. What we can say for certain is that neither the radiation nor the contaminated water at the plant is getting any less, and there is no guarantee that the battle against them will turn out in our favor. So what's TEPCO's response to this crisis? The company has announced plans to begin releasing underground water near the Pacific Ocean as soon as Wednesday, May 21st, according to Asahi Shinbun. Wednesday, May 21st is tomorrow from where I am now recording this. The first water to be released will total around 560 tons, which is barely a day and a half's worth of radioactive water. Initial talks between the government of Japan and TEPCO agreed that only water with 1,500 becquerels of radiation or less per liter could be released. Tests conducted by TEPCO and two unnamed outside agencies have revealed that the Fukushima underground water met the standards, averaging 220 to 240 becquerels of tritium per liter. Again with the tritium. Tritium is a beta emitter and can be stopped by metal, but cesium is a gamma emitter, which penetrates much more deeply and is much more difficult to stop. Why the sudden switch? Well, gee, do you think they might have something to hide? Meanwhile, up to 400 tons of contaminated water from the damaged facility is, I love this word in the report, seeping into the Pacific Ocean every day. When you're talking 400 tons, you're not talking about seep. Seepage is a little stuff. 400 tons, that's flowing. So just what are we talking about as the consequences of exposure to radiation? Smithsonian Magazine, as of May 14, had an article that stated that even tiny amounts of radioactive food made caterpillars become abnormal butterflies. Researchers in Japan, the article stated, discovered even a small amount of radiation is too much. Scientists collected plant material from around Fukushima and fed it to pale grass blue butterfly caterpillars. When the caterpillars turned into butterflies, they suffered from mutations and were more likely to die early, even if they had only eaten a small amount of the cesium. In other words, Things don't look good for the animals living around Fukushima. Uh, Smithsonian, how about the people? In Nature, scientific reports, on May 15th, it stated, both the mortality and abnormality rates increased sharply, especially at low doses. There seemed to be no threshold level below which no biological response could be detected. This, of course, was stated a long time ago in the BEER-7 report, BEER standing for Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation. Going back to the article, in conclusion, it is important to realize the risk of internal radiation exposure due to ingested radioactive cesium, at least for the pale grass blue butterfly, and likely for certain other organisms living in the polluted area, possibly including humans. When are they just going to go ovaries out and take away the modifiers, like possibly, and just state what we're up against, which is the creek without a paddle? So how bad is it? 
The Fukushima prefectural government, despite their agreement with the IAEA, has confirmed in a new report that 50-50 children in the prefecture have developed thyroid cancer, an increase of 17 from the previous study last December. The latest report, made on Monday, May 19, to an expert panel examining the results of health checkups on Fukushima residents, also detailed 39 children suspected of having developed cancer, sources said. The children were all 18 years or younger at the time of the March 11, 2011 nuclear accident. But after studying data provided so far, including the new cancer figures, the panel said it was difficult to determine that a causal link existed between the children's cancers and the triple meltdown at the nuclear power plant. Remember, they're in league with the IAEA. Liars. That's a 51.5% increase in cancer rates since February of this year. Further, of 287,056 children whose initial examination results were confirmed, 48.4% showed nodules or cysts on their thyroid. We'll have more on reported health impact in Fukushima and elsewhere in Japan during our interview and special information segment coming up shortly. Former Japanese Prime Ministers Junichiri Koizume and Morihiro Hosokawa have officially established an organization to abolish atomic power, but say they will avoid being directly involved in politics. Koizumi said, Japan is an earthquake-prone country, and the government has not taken effective measures to protect nuclear power plants from terrorism. He was addressing the Japan Assembly for Nuclear-Free Renewable Energy in Tokyo on May 7. Koizumi added that it is a blatant lie that nuclear power is safe, cost-effective, and clean energy. Citing the crushing defeat of Hosokawa in the Tokyo gubernatorial election in February, where he split the anti-nuclear vote, Koizumi said, We lost a battle, but are standing up with an unyielding spirit to create a nuclear-free country. Hosokawa, who serves as the representative of the nonprofit General Incorporated Association, said 60% of Japanese oppose bringing reactors back online and 80% support the eventual abolition of nuclear power. He went on to say, we must turn to renewable energy to create a society without fear of radiation contamination. Amen to that. A woman too. Okay, it's that time again. Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's not awake. Ah, the power of celebrities to influence public discourse, or not. And we're dealing with two nots today. Paul McCartney, Sir Paul, former Beatle, current continuing aging rock star, was in Tokyo again to do another series of concerts. Now, you may recall that last November, he was in Japan to do a series of three concerts. And while there, he magnanimously met with three survivors of Fukushima and invited them to watch his concert in the Tokyo Dome. And then, in an act of either tremendous irony or unspeakable insensitivity, McCartney reportedly dedicated the Beatles' hit yesterday to the victims of the Fukushima disaster. That was last November. Not a word, really, about the issues that were involved. Well, now he's back in Japan, but he got hit with a virus and had to cancel his concerts. So apparently Japan's a great place for Sir Paul to go and grab some money, but not necessarily to use a more politically conscious voice when he has the opportunity. I mean, where is John Lennon when we need him? On the other hand, we have Caroline Kennedy Schlossberg still known professionally as Caroline Kennedy, who is the American ambassador to Japan. Even though her father was responsible for the signing of the nuclear test ban treaty, his daughter has been remarkably mum on the subject of Fukushima, 
last week, the Spinmeisters had their way with her and suited her up in full hazmat, got her into the plant, and when she left, she said that the United States, quote, will offer our experience and capabilities in particular towards the near-term resolution of ongoing water contamination issues. Caroline, is that the best you could do? The U.S. will offer its experience and capabilities, but I'm willing to bet that doesn't include Arne Gunderson. You are used as a prop of the nuclear industry and nuclear interests in Japan and elsewhere, and exposed not only yourself, but your 21-year-old son to the radiation from Fukushima that was both on site and that has migrated into the environment in Japan. Good going. What these two individuals don't understand is the power that they would have to turn this entire issue around if they would just focus attention on it and speak on behalf of the people who are suffering so terribly and the world that is still so much at risk from the Fukushima Daiichi disaster, the ongoing Fukushima Daiichi disaster. But it appears that Sir Paul lacks the social conscience of John Lennon, and Carolyn Kennedy, whether she uses Schlossberg or not, so far lacks the ovaries to follow in her father's footsteps. And that's why these two individuals are this week's Nuclear Hot Seat, none that's out of week. Let's do a quick roundup on the U.S., shall we? Down in New Mexico, the radiation leak at the government's troubled waste isolation pilot plant, or WIP, site has been linked to a waste container shipped from the Los Alamos National Laboratory. This raises serious questions about the safety of other barrels from Los Alamos being stored on the lab's northern New Mexico site and at a temporary site in West Texas. Waste Control Specialist, which is storing the drums of waste above ground. Los Alamos Lab Director Charlie McMillan wrote in a memo on Friday to his lab employees, We do not believe there is any imminent threat to the safety of our employees, the public, or the environment at this time. How many qualifiers could he possibly put in that sentence? And isn't that what they always say? There are 116 containers from Los Alamos at WCS in Texas and a total of 292 at WIP. Tra-la, tra -la. Last Wednesday, a Senate committee questioned a panel of specialists about the safety and security of nuclear reactors that have been retired or forced out of business. It was a hearing of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee and Democratic Chairwoman Barbara Boxer of California asked the specialist whether enough had been done to assure that spent fuel from the decommissioned reactors, which is being stored on site, was being properly secured. The reactors may be shut down, Senator Boxer said, but the risk of an accident or attack have not gone away. NRC officials and industry executives assured her that there was enough oversight, which means either overseeing or overlooking, was already in place to assure that decommissioned reactors and the fuel were safe. But then Senator Boxer asked Michael F. Weber, the NRC's Deputy Executive Director for Operations, Materials, and Waste, if he was concerned that at San Onofre, the decommissioned reactors on the Pacific Coast, the spent fuel pools were designed to hold 1,600 fuel assemblies, but now held 2,600, 1,000 extra. Does this disturb you, this fact, she asked? It took her two tries before he answered in a total non sequitur, yes, we ensure safety. Yes, it concerns you, she said, adding, if it concerns you, then why aren't you moving now to get that fuel out? Go, Senator Babs. As if to prove the point of San Onofre's vulnerability, last week the brush fires in San Diego County, and specifically at Camp Pendleton, threatened the San Onofre nuclear power plant, and about half a dozen employees were evacuated from outlying facilities. Plant operator Southern California Edison announced the evacuations of the non-essential workers on Twitter and then notified federal safety officials at the NRC just before noon of the precautionary evacuation of a portion of the plant's grounds known as the South Yard. So it doesn't have to be an earthquake, a tsunami, or terrorists. It can just be a brush fire. Here's some more on San Onofre. 
Two weeks ago, we heard from Ray Lutz of Citizens Oversight Project in San Diego about the massive closed door manipulations that led to a pork filled settlement that cannot be controverted at this point, at least according to the people who did it, that Southern California Edison is going to be paid $3.3 billion from ratepayers to compensate them for their incompetence and shenanigans surrounding the attempted replacement of the steam generators at San Onofre with, shall we say, a jury-rigged, unproven and unapproved design. Last week, an evidentiary hearing was held between the California Public Utilities Commission and the public purportedly to explain this settlement. Listen to a brief clip. CPUC President and Commissioner Michael R. Peavy responding to a request for a statement by Michael Aguirre, counsel for Ruth Hedricks, a party to the proceedings, that was asked from the room. The voice on the microphone is Peavy and from the room is Aguirre. The only comment I would make is that I came here today hoping to be educated. I, I walk out of here without it, uh, that happening. I'm very disappointed by the whole uh, uh, back and forth here. I, it has not illuminated the settlement one iota. As far as turn goes, I think, with general knowledge, my relationship with turn is to be uh, fair, chilly, and I have never talked to Mr. Freeman on this topic during that whole time at all. Period. Mr. Friedman. That's it. Sorry. What about Southern Cal Edison? Sorry. About Edison? Yeah, I, I'm, about not, I'm not here to answer your questions. Your I'm not here to answer your goddamn questions. Now shut up. Shut up. Really? That's how yeah. you support it? Yeah. The California Public Utilities Commission standing up for all we ratepayers. Not. We'll have a link to Ray Lutz's edit of the three-hour and 20-minute hearing, which breaks down to about a billion per hour for SCE, we'll have that link up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this week's episode number 152. Now for a brief visit to the NRC duck <laughs> and cover report. Beaver Valley Nuclear Reactors 1 and 2 in Shippingsport, Pennsylvania, just 34 miles from Pittsburgh, showed problems with two unfused DC control circuits, and the NRC postulated that a hot, short fire event could adversely impact safe shutdown equipment. Among the areas directly impacted, the control room. An aging cooling system at the Fitzpatrick nuclear plant in Oswego County, New York, is springing leaks so often that plant operators had to reduce power 11 times during just the first three months of 2014 so that workers could plug the leaks. Fitzpatrick's condenser, which circulates Lake Ontario water for cooling, leaks far more than any other U.S. plant, in part because Fitzpatrick operators failed to repair the aging equipment, according to the U.S. NRC. The NRC keeps the plant under heightened oversight. There's that word again. They're overlooking whatever they can. The regulators say that the leaking condenser does not pose a major safety issue, perhaps a minor one, and that the leaks are expected to be resolved by a major repair during a refueling outage later this year. So it's not a major safety issue, but it's going to take a major repair. Figure that one out. And workers at the Indian Point nuclear power plant just outside Manhattan mistakenly tried twice, not once, but twice, to place a second bundle of used nuclear fuel into a spot already holding one during maintenance work. This happened in March, according to the NRC. Because the maneuver didn't result in any radiation release or damage any spent fuel in the storage pool, the NRC deemed the matter to be of very low safety significance. The numbnuts can't even figure out there's already a car in the parking place and they try to park another one and you don't think that has a low safety significance? And that's why we call it the NRC Duck <laughs> and Cover Report. Internationally, Ukrainian police stopped a group of armed men from entering Europe's largest nuclear power plant, the Zaporizhia facility, located in southeast Ukraine. Also in Ukraine, against all odds, an Irish-funded international surgical team has gotten through the strife-torn Ukraine and landed in Kharkiv to provide life-saving cardiac operations for more than 60 critically ill children. 
The mission has been organized by Irish humanitarian aid agency Adi Roche's Chernobyl Children International. This is a mercy mission to Ukraine where 6,000 babies a year are born with heart defects. And heart defects are a common result of exposure to cesium-137 released from Chernobyl. And in Canada, a federal court ruling has thrown out the preliminary approvals for a series of new nuclear power reactors at the Darlington plant in Ontario. Justice James Russell said the environmental assessment for the proposed expansion of the Darlington nuclear plant fell short. Sean Patrick Stensel of Greenpeace said, this is a common sense ruling. It boggles the mind that the federal authorities approved new reactors without first considering the environmental effects of radioactive waste and reactor accidents. A reminder that Nuclear Hot Seat's ability to continue is based on donations. So if you can help, please do. No amount is too small. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com and on the homepage, scroll down to the donate button and whatever you can offer. Thank you so much. It's appreciated and definitely needed. This week, we present another in our ongoing series, Voices from Japan. Nuclear Hot Seat provides the opportunity for people in Japan affected by the ongoing Fukushima nuclear disaster to say what they want to the world that we are not hearing and that they believe we need to know. Their words are unedited, their input uncensored, and we post this information in both the English Nuclear Hot Seat and in a special Japanese version. First, we hear from the former mayor of Futaba, Mayor Katsutaka Itagawa. As host to the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, the town of Futaba suffered devastating harm. In the confusing aftermath of the accident, amid a lack of information, Mayor Itagawa, as his community's top decision maker, took the unusual step of leading his people outside of Fukushima Prefecture in order to protect them from harmful radiation. He has resigned his position as mayor, but continues to be an outspoken critic of the government and TEPCO's handling of the accident. Recently, controversy over the manga comic Oishinbo's depiction of the situation in Fukushima has reverberated around Japan. One of the main points of contention in the manga are words spoken by a character based on the real-life Mayor Itagawa and called Mayor Itagawa. Nuclear Hot Seat has an exclusive interview with Mayor Itagawa on this topic in the works. In today's interview, he outlines his disappointment and fears connected with the Fukushima Daiichi accident and his concerns about the societal malaise affecting Japan. Uh, Three years have passed already. The feelings of regret and frustration caused by the deplorable circumstances of March 11, 2011 continue even now. What is most frustrating is that the government and TEPCO promised us that the nuclear power plant would not cause an accident. As mayor, I sat in my office with those people over the years and discussed the possibilities of an accident occurring. Did they tell the truth? They always said, Mr. Mayor, don't worry. An accident will definitely never happen. Well, the nuclear power plant broke down pretty easily in the earthquake and tsunami, didn't it? It fell apart that easily, didn't it? The operation of nuclear power plants was based on a lie. This accident is proof that nuclear power is an incomplete technology. Furthermore, the nuclear power plant destroyed our town. The town is a public entity a privately owned, for-profit utility corporation destroyed a public body, a town. I don't think there is another example like this in history. 
horrible things happened after Chernobyl too, but the conditions in this country are different. In Japan, we have the right to self-government. It is the nuclear accident that has broken down this system and set people adrift. And because they haven't received enough compensation, they have lost their futures. The villagers who have lost their dreams are heartbroken. In the midst of all this sorrow, Prime Minister Abe is facing outward and promoting exports of nuclear power plants. Despite the nuclear situation in his own country being unclear, and with the cleanup of the accident is still not progressing. Abe is trying to pass off defective merchandise as top world-class technology. It's embarrassing, isn't it? As a Japanese citizen, I am truly ashamed. When Japan was a healthy country, we did not try to sell imperfect goods. During the time when Japan valued quality above all else, this would not have happened. Furthermore, the contaminated water from the plant is polluting the Pacific Ocean more and more. I feel humiliated when Abe lies to the world, when he says that the radioactive contamination is completely blocked from spreading further into the ocean. We have to return to our roots. We have a right to go back. It is really unfortunate that there is not a single politician or bureaucrat who has been able to stop this problem. I urge the people of the world to take a look at us. What kind of lives are we being forced to live right now? Even though we are not the ones who caused the accident, we are living in conditions that punish us for what happened. Our dreams, our children's futures, our towns have all been destroyed. We have been swept to the very margins of Japanese society and told to live there in silence. I don't wish these tragic circumstances on anyone ever again. Nuclear facilities bring misfortune on humankind. We all need to raise our voices and demand a safe environment where we can live and children can have dreams. We inherited a clean environment from our parents, but I as a parent, cannot pass along a clean and beautiful town to my own children. This sad situation can never happen again. Please, don't just help us. Please help humankind. The former mayor of Futaba, Katsutaka Idagawa. Next, we hear from Satomi Horiki. She is a citizen filmmaker whose documentary, Driven Out of a Nuclear Town, a documentary about the refugees from Futaba, won a Yayori Journalist Award in 2013. The film depicts the deep emotional and physical trials faced by the group of Futaba citizens who followed Mayor Itagawa to settle in an abandoned high school far away from Fukushima Prefecture. Horikiri has shown her film at screenings all around Japan. She often appears with some of the Futaba evacuees featured in the film. <laughs> driven out of a nuclear town, about the people who evacuated to my hometown from Futaba town in the wake of the nuclear accident three years ago. My name is Horikiri. When I heard that Fukushima Daiichi had exploded, 
I was so shocked. I thought, this is the end. I became very concerned about the fates of the people who were living near the power plant when a large number of people from Fukushima evacuated to Saitama Prefecture, where I live. Over the past three years, I collected their stories and made a documentary film. The people from Futaba relocated to Kisai High School, which had been shut down. 20% of Futaba's population or around 1,400 people traveled 186 miles from Futaba to Saitama and settled in this abandoned school. Why was Futaba the only town to evacuate in a group like this? It is because neither the government nor TEPCO issued specific evacuation orders for people to go to a particular location. Instead of providing evacuation facilities, the central government left it up to the municipalities to decide where to relocate. In this situation, the mayor of Futaba, Mayor Idogawa, who had some knowledge about radiation, decided that it was important to evacuate the people as far as possible from the vast amounts of radiation being emitted. He decided on distant Saitama because he knew that would be the only way to protect their health. I believe that he made the right decision. I began to visit Kisai High School and listen to the stories of the people from Futaba. Well, 1,400 people were living in the classroom and gymnasium, and there was absolutely no privacy. I think it was really hard on them. They were provided with boxed meals, but they had no jobs and no privacy and no idea of when they might be able to return to their hometown. In Futaba, they had their homes, their land, their family gravesite, and their community. I think it was really difficult for them to live in Saitama, where they didn't have any of these things. If it's just an earthquake, you can rebuild right there in the same spot, but with a nuclear accident, you can't return to your hometown. You have to start over in a different town. What makes it worse for Futaba is that their homes are pretty much intact, maybe with a little bit of earthquake damage. But they can't live there because of radiation, which is invisible. It's a paradoxical situation. The evacuees in Saitama often wondered about the idea of reconstruction. What would it mean for them? They were spending the whole day at the evacuation center, idle, with no jobs. They could really be back in Futaba, clearing debris, rebuilding their businesses, or fixing their family gravesite. If they could do that, reconstruction would be tangible. But they couldn't even step foot on their own property. That was a bitter and painful situation. At first, Elderly people were expectant, wondering when exactly they would be able to return. But recently, they have gradually realized that the radiation levels are just too high and that they will never be able to go back. They have no alternative but to give up. Not only among the elderly, but across all age groups, there is a tremendous feeling of loss. Ms. Horikiri, as someone who has been in close contact with the evacuees from Futaba, including Mayor Itagawa, what is your take on the recent Oishimbo manga controversy? Oishimbo. Well, as for Mayor Itagawa, that issue put him back in the headlines, didn't it? I've been following him for a while, and as far as I can tell, he has suffered a great deal of exposure to radiation. But it's not just Idogawa-san. There are a lot of people who are in ill health and experiencing symptoms that they've never had before. Why is there such disapproval if you express any misgivings about your health condition and attribute it to radiation? Well, that's because it's a foregone conclusion that Fukushima is safe and secure 
and that there is no health effect from radiation released from the explosion at the nuclear power plant. What we can see from the turmoil caused by the manga is that any objections raised against that foregone conclusion will be completely and thoroughly crushed. That was Satome Horikiri. Her film has been translated into English, and if you are interested in setting up a screening, please contact Beverly Findlay Kaneko by leaving a message at the Families for Safe Energy Facebook page. Now, regarding the comic strip heard round the world, Oishinmo is a weekly manga comic that has been running with only one interruption since 1983. It's about the adventures of a gourmet critic for a newspaper. Nothing controversial there, right? Except two weeks ago, the first in a three-week arc of stories dealing with Fukushima radiation and food showed a group of journalist characters accidentally being exposed to high levels of radiation and experiencing nosebleeds and extreme fatigue. Well, nothing like a little nuclear reality infiltrating a weekly comic strip to throw an entire country into a tizzy. Outrage. Letters to the editor. Official pressure. This included an official complaint to the publisher Shogakan from officials of Futaba Town, claiming, at present, there is no basis in fact that there are many citizens reporting symptoms such as nosebleeds to the town office. Yet, in November of 2012, then-Mayor Itagawa of Futaba Town, a team from Okayama University, Hiroshima University, and Kumamoto Gakuen University, conducted a health survey of Futaba residents. Results were published by Professor Nakachi from Kumamoto Gakuen University in an article entitled Environmental Contamination Caused by the Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Accident and Tsunami from the Perspective of Minamata Studies. For comparison purposes, Futaba, Maromori Town in Miyagi Prefecture, which is right on the border with Fukushima Prefecture, and Nagahama Town in distant Shiga Prefecture were surveyed. In Futaba and Maromori, there was a high incidence of symptoms such as lethargy, headaches, dizziness, itchy eyes, nosebleeds, and nausea. Nosebleeds were particularly high. Note that all of these are acknowledged as symptoms of exposure to radiation. The report asserted that the symptoms were caused by the nuclear accident and refugee lifestyle. Regarding the current plaints against Oishinbo by Futaba officials, Professor Nakachi stated, We submitted our report to Futaba town last year in August. Perhaps they have forgotten about it. Professor Tsuda from Okayama University stated that the team has not yet published their final results, but he said, the government keeps saying that there is no relationship between nosebleeds and radiation exposure. There is no scientific basis for this statement. There are reports from Chernobyl. I don't think such a fuss should be made over the Oishinbo manga. When questioned about the contradiction between the study results received by Futaba Town last year, and the recent complaint submitted to the publisher at Oishinbo, the Health and Welfare Department of Futaba Town stated, The person in charge at that time has retired. We will have to look at our records to confirm what happened. In other words, the old, my dog ate it, defense. Meanwhile, the protests against Oishinbo have taken their toll. On Monday, May 18, the editor of Oishinbo defended the decision to depict characters in the cooking comic book as potentially hurt by radiation in Fukushima, calling it a meaningful attempt to sound the alarm about the grim and largely overlooked reality of life in the prefecture. In Monday's installment of the series, Hiroshi Murayama, who is also managing editor of the weekly Big Comic Spirits magazine that the series runs in, includes an afterword in which he writes of feeling a strong pang of responsibility for the outrage caused by recent issues of the manga. Moriyama said the storyline was meant to spotlight the truth that, quote, parts of Fukushima are indeed dangerous and uninhabitable, 
and some local people are worried about health problems linked to radioactive fallout. Their voices, he said, are rarely heard because they are reluctant to complain of sickness for fear of being branded as, quote, overly squeamish. Manga author Tetsu Kariya, who has made repeated visits to the plant since the triple meltdowns, decided that it, quote, is wrong to ignore the voices of those people just because these are considered in the minority and likely to unsettle others. As editor-in-chief, Moriyama added, I decided Korea's viewpoint was worth presenting to readers for their opinions. The main characters in the long-running Oishinbo, which translates as the gourmet, are culinary writers working for a fictional newspaper company. On Monday, they conclude that, as journalists, they must face the pain of telling the truth about Fukushima. Remaining silent, they decide, is equal to, quote, lying to the Fukushima residents. When it comes to the livability of Fukushima, one of the characters said, there is a tendency to, quote, sugarcoat your language in order to spare the feelings of the resident. But I think doing so is hypocritical. He adds, as a human being, I would like to encourage people in Fukushima to have the courage to flee their dangerous homeland. Kairiwo wrote in a blog post that he can only spread the truth. Trumpeting the safety of Fukushima, he wrote, may have pleased some, but deception is what I abhor most. Monday's issue of Big Comic Spirits devotes 10 pages to laying out the opinions of 13 experts and municipalities. One of them, Hiroake Koide, who has previously been interviewed as part of the Voices from Japan series, and is an assistant professor at the Kyoto University Research Reactor Institute, says that from a medical point of view, the connection between nosebleeds and radiation exposure can't be entirely ruled out. Back in Korea, he says, the government is not only indifferent to taking responsibility for the accident, but determined to erase it from people's memory. Such irresponsibility, he insists, is, quote, almost criminal. End quote. Meanwhile, municipalities including Osaka and Fukushima prefectures and the town of Futaba have lodged complaints with the publisher, and these have, alas, derailed the series. Oishinbo will not appear in the publisher's weekly Big Comic Spirits magazine as of the May 26th issue. So what about the Fukushima nosebleed radiation connection? Laura Inouye of Komoro Homestay for Fukushima Families in Nagano was a guest on Nuclear Hot Seat number 142, the Fukushima anniversary special where we first introduced Voices from Japan. In relation to the controversy kicked up by Oishinbo, she writes, We know that from very early on, there were an unusually large number of nosebleeds, just from the experiences of friends and acquaintances. It's just the truth. The way the public responds to this has been manipulated to discourage discussion and is very symbolic of the way natural worry about the effects of radiation, particularly on children, has been suppressed. Soon after the cartoon was published, a person to be referred to only as the letter G, for reasons of privacy, tried to buy a copy of the magazine. He went from convenience store to convenience store, where it would normally be stocked, and couldn't find it, although there were other magazines from the same publisher. G thinks it was deliberately moved. Mothers in particular are very isolated and stressed. They cannot talk about it. As the emergency mode of 2011 recedes, this continues and will continue. Those were the words of Laura Inoue of Komoro Homestay for Fukushima Families in Nagano. You will hear more from Laura in a future nuclear hot seat. Finally, this report just translated by Ryuichi Hirokawa, editor of Days Japan, also weighing in on the manga controversy. He specifically pointed out the issue of nosebleeds and a scene depicting symptoms of fatigue. In particular, he wrote, the nosebleed scene has received complaints of being impossible 
or of causing anxiety. And he went on. Immediately after the Fukushima Daiichi accident, I experienced punishing fatigue myself. From the morning of March 13, 2011, I went on a series of investigative missions to the areas nearby the power plant. There were times that the readings were so high that my dosimeter could not measure them. After that, in April, I was suddenly struck with lethargy, fatigue, and diarrhea. Later in this article, I will statistically demonstrate whether there is a connection between radiation exposure and fatigue. How about nosebleeds? I often experienced discomfort in the mucous membranes of my nose, but I didn't have free-flowing nosebleeds. In July 2012, I established the Kuminosato Recuperation Facility for Fukushima kids in Okinawa. I often hear the parents who accompany their children on the program discuss the problem of nosebleeds. I've heard people talk about it in Fukushima too. I thought the nosebleed problem was common knowledge. Therefore, I am suspicious of the clamor caused by the Oishinbo manga and the accusation that it's unlikely or not based on fact and the attempts to deny it so completely. Doesn't making such a big deal about it ironically cause the very anxiety among Fukushima residents that the manga's detractors are complaining about? I think it would be far more constructive to recognize that people are experiencing nosebleeds and then make sure that this is not a symptom of a more serious illness. Since 1986, I have been on over 50 journalistic and humanitarian missions to Chernobyl. This March, I visited after a five-year hiatus to do some research with a filmmaking team. While I was in the highly contaminated area of Narodyechi in Ukraine, I spoke with the assistant director of the Narodyechi Central Hospital and told him that I had heard many people talking about children's nosebleeds in Fukushima and asked him about the experience in Chernobyl. He answered, there was an increase in nosebleeds after the Chernobyl accident. There was an increase in radiation exposure related blood disorders after the accident. Nosebleeds were one example and anemia increased too. He said that precursor symptoms to leukemia also rose. In 1990, the IAEA dispatched a research team to Chernobyl and the following year, they issued a report intending to deny concerns about the health effects of that accident. I had my doubts about that report and my office cooperated with the Chernobyl Children's Fund, which I was the director of at that time, to compile an independent research study with the help of local NGOs. We surveyed refugees from August 1993 to April 1996. Our survey had hundreds of items and was answered by individuals and families. We were able to collect responses from 25,564 people. It is believed that there is no other large scale survey like this of Chernobyl victims. We were able to achieve this because it was part of our humanitarian effort. If we were able to grasp what health problems affected the people, we would be able to tailor our humanitarian work. Conducting the survey was difficult, but we had strengths that the IAEA did not have. Those were the achievements of our humanitarian work until that point and the relationships we had built with the local NGOs. Moreover, we had no other purpose than helping the disaster victims. The results of our study were published in magazine form in Japanese and Russian. A portion of our findings appeared in Reckless Nuclear, published by Shogakan after 311 this year. I would like to look at the results with a particular focus on nosebleeds and fatigue. I do want to note, however, that people were affected by many other symptoms as well. What follows is a brief summary of the results of that survey by Ryuichi Hirokawa on the impact of Chernobyl on residents living nearby. In Pripyat, which was only two miles from the plant, with 9,501 people responding, within one week of the accident, 
1,838 people, or 19.3% of those responding, experienced nosebleeds, and 5,346 people, or 56.3%, related having extreme fatigue. Ten years later, 19.3% of people still reported having nosebleeds, the exact same proportion as one week after the accident, and 753 people, or 74.2%, reported that they tire easily. In Chernobyl, which was 10.5 miles away from the facility, with 2,127 people responding, 21.6%, or 459 people reported having nosebleeds within one week of the accident, and 1,312 people, or just under 62%, reported having extreme fatigue. Their present-day health conditions include 19.6% of them, 417 people, still experiencing nosebleeds. Much the same was reported in villages around Chernobyl with 12,864 people responding, 19.4% experienced nosebleeds within a week of the accident, and 56.4 or 7,259 people had extreme fatigue, more than half of those people interviewed. Four miles from the plant, with 351 people responding, 18.5% experienced nosebleeds within one week of the accident, and 54.7% had extreme fatigue, while currently 19.9%, an even higher percentage, experienced nosebleeds, and 76.4% report that they tire easily. For comparison purposes, a survey of 316 people in Moscow reported that only 3.2% of those people said that they were having nosebleeds, and only 21.2% said that they tire easily. Not that they were experiencing extreme fatigue, just that they got tired. So one in five Chernobyl refugees experienced nosebleeds in a study of over 25,500 people. This, according to a report by journalist Ryuichi Hirakawa, who is editor of Days Japan. Nuclear Hot Seat will, of course, continue to follow this story. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, May 20th, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, fukuleaks.org, Japan Times, Gigi Press, Medici Daily News, Reuters, Smithsonian Magazine, Nature, Asahi Shimbun, Yahoo News, FinanceGreenWatch.org, Express.co.uk, AP, New York Times, the NRC, Syracuse.com, Lohud.com, RT.com, and OttawaCitizen.com, as well as the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Love you guys. Voices from Japan is a co-production of Nuclear Hot Seat and the Families for Safe Energy team. Translations by Beverly Finlay Kaneko, who also serves as co-producer, and many thanks to our terrific crew of voiceover actors, including Alpha Takahashi as the voice of Horikiri. Special thanks to Ray Lutz for his CPUC audio clip, and acknowledging again Myra Reason for last week's reporting and research on the WIP situation. Theme music written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts, or you can search us out on the website NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed for nonprofit means. Permission granted as long as proper attribution, website, and email are included. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are licking. Nuclear hot seat. It's
Mr. Bomb. <laughs> Oh yeah, go on, click the subscribe button. Uh, we need to get subscribe and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us guys and it's, it's really bad.